Welcome, Paul, to this series of featured articles. Uh, today we will be talking about the program of learning and cognition that you are heading. Uh, could you start by introducing the program to me, please? Our program has three basic areas that we're trying to study. Uh, the first area is how you can make uh, learning and learning environments more flexible for achieving what we would call higher order cognitive skills. That's not memorizing facts or things like that, but being able to uh, apply, uh, synthesize knowledge, uh, even evaluate things in terms of bloom, and to be able to transfer that to other situations. Uh, a second area uh, which is very important at the moment is how uh, learners deal with what we call information problem solving. Uh, students are bombarded with much more information than was the case 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, these uh, problems uh, that, uh, with dealing with all this information is that there's no actually well-known or accepted source anymore, but that almost anybody can place anything, or actually anybody can place anything on the web. And the third area that we deal with is um, expertise development. Um, Possibly you could say this because we're an area dealing with also with lifelong learning. So we're not only dealing with initial learners, which you might call novices, but also dealing with learners who have a certain body or domain of knowledge. How do we now design and develop and implement learning environments, learning situations for learners with a fairly large amount of expertise? So those are the three areas that we're dealing with. Could you say a little bit about those themes? Uh, tasks, environments, and assessment plays a role. For example, if we're talking about uh, expertise and expertise development, that third area that I spoke of, uh, the type of task that you would give to a novice would be or should be completely different, the question is how, than that which you give to an expert. Uh, the environment that you're in to do that should be flexible enough, and that was that first uh, uh, theme that I was talking about, should be flexible enough so that the environment itself determines there is a certain amount of expertise, I should give a different type of task. And of course the way you assess whether or not an expert has achieved that which he or she should achieve would be completely different than a novice. Urban legends, I've been reading some of your stuff on uh, urban legends, some of your columns. Um, I, w I was wondering, uh, what's the relation between those urban legends and uh, the themes you're investigating in your research? I think uh, one of the most salient urban legends uh, at the moment is uh, what we see as uh, uh, the cone of learning or uh, the pyramid of learning. Uh, it's been attributed to quite a number of people, Bates, Bales, Bateson, Dale. Um, they've all been brought into uh, focus if you're talking about this cone or pyramid of learning. If you look at uh, and, and you Google this cone of experience in NTI, you'll see that NTI itself says, yes, we published it at a certain point in time, but we have absolutely no data to back it up. We don't know where the data is from the original, but it, it's, it's, it's gotten kind of a life of its own. Not how much is learned, but how do people learn from it? And we will, we're trying to eradicate those types. Now, there are six or seven very, very pungent, very, very hard core urban legends that we find at the moment, I won't go into them now, um, which um, I present a, a number of, 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 of presentations on, which I've written an article with a, a colleague on, and which I hope to eradicate. I was wondering what makes your program unique? What would be, let's say, leading principles that really differentiate your program with other programs into learning sciences? I think what uh, differentiates us from the others, our unique selling points, and possibly for others the, the unique buying points, is that um, we try not to be dogmatic or paradigmatic in what we're doing. We don't say you should use simulations, we don't say you should be social constructivist, we don't say that collaborative learning is the only way to, to learn, we don't say that cognitivism is the best or the only way to do it. Uh, what we try to do is make use and that goes immediately over to the second point, the unique selling point. We try to base our research in well-studied, well-founded theories. There is no guarantee. Uh, 
I think the, the best way uh, to do that, and that's what we're trying to do, is um, uh, step away from the uh, typical uh, mode of study in which, uh, uh, research I should say, in which you have these one-shot deals of uh, PhD students, PhD candidates, uh, who do a piece of research in four years they're done and you go on to the next. We want to make a continuous uh, program in which the research being done by one person is um, are the shoulders of the following researcher. To give you an example, children nowadays can work faster with the modern technologies in any event than the digital immigrants such as yourself and myself. But what all of this research also shows is that it's highly surface level. That it has nothing to do with good, deep use of the media. So they're acquainted with, but there's something completely different with being able to use it optimally. What would be the main uh, developments, the main shifts, trends in your research? Or let's rephrase it, what would be the main challenges? If I bring it back to, to, to one, I would say, um, doing good research on how people study and the effects of different ways of studying on what and how people learn and fighting and defeating the windmills of ignorance within the field of teaching, uh, educational design, ed educational innovation, um, then I have the idea that in any event in the next four or five years I've achieved something that I can be proud of.